our work done with, the year 1920 finds Franklin D. Roosevelt at the threshold of a new career. He began to take a prominent place in councils of his party. His keen-minded and progressive thoughts were eagerly sought on state and national affairs. When the Democrats gathered in San Francisco in July 1920 for their national convention, Roosevelt's name was on many tongues. It was inevitable that he should be nominated for vice president to run with James M. Cox. Enthusiastically, he stumped the country, preaching the ideals of Woodrow Wilson and rallying the party to the support of the ticket. Wherever he spoke, his vibrant personality and flashing smile made new friends. There was a ring of sincerity in his voice that the people liked and which they never forgot. Loyally and energetically, he fought the stern battle for his chief and for the party. With James M. Cox, he looked on with kindling eyes while San Francisco turned out a great parade in their honor. These were stirring hours in the life of our president, where he was getting his first lessons in the art of national campaigning. He loved the gay clamor of the political battle as he loves it now. He responded to every stirring phase of the exciting, moving panorama of political life. These marching people were not merely voters to Franklin Roosevelt, they were human beings. And to their greeting, he responded with his gay and gallant humanity. But his thoughts were back home in beautiful Hyde Park with Mrs. Roosevelt and their four children and very little folks they were in those days, and with his favorite dog. His thoughts went back to the wife who'd been his boyhood sweetheart and always his loyal helpmate. But the campaigning had to go on, even though he felt the cause was lost. In speech after speech, with the extraordinary energy, which is even now the amazement of the nation, he sought to rally the discouraged democracy. Wherever he appeared, his warm personality and friendliness caught the crowd. People surged about him, and when the campaign came to its close, there was the same eager desire on the part of the public to get a close-up of this new young champion of democratic principle, this young man in politics who had proved himself by good works. And then it was back home in earnest to be greeted at his door by his adoring mother, to speak to old friends and neighbors in simple, friendly words of greeting and welcome. and to shake hands with folks who came from miles around to greet neighbor Frank. Then came an interval of political quiet spent with Mrs. Roosevelt and with their four youngsters. And then the great political battle of 1924 where with Alfred E. Smith and John W. Davis, he stood out as a leader. There never was a political convention to match the Democratic National Gathering of 1924 in New York for drama and color and bitterness. McAdoo against Al Smith, day after day of fruitless balloting, terrific storms of passion shaking the delegates and convulsing the thousands in the gallery. The high note of all, Franklin D. Roosevelt's presentation of the name of Alfred E. Smith, and the deathless phrase, the happy warrior. Democratic Convention at Houston in the Lone Star State, and once more Franklin D. Roosevelt took the stage to praise as only he could do, the man for whom he has always had such affection and respect, naming him again, the happy warrior, his friend, Alfred E. Smith, the governor of New York. Al Smith, who will always have his own place in the hearts of the American people. But events were moving fast. Al Smith as candidate for president in 1928, wanted a good man to run for governor of New York. He persuaded Franklin Roosevelt to make the race. And although Mr. Smith lost the state by a narrow vote, Franklin Roosevelt was elected to his first term as governor. And we see him in his new high office for the first time. And as he participates with Mrs. Lehman at the inaugural ball, at that very moment, an even greater honor was looming in the near distance. But he himself, engrossed by his duties as governor of the Empire State, was content to do the work in hand. Occasionally, he took time off to attend public gatherings, such as the State Fair at Syracuse, driving there with his mother, Mrs. Sarah Delano Roosevelt. 
And in his democratic fashion, he took his lunch in the outdoor restaurant with an appetite sharpened by his holiday away from the rigors of office. His relaxation and exercise was swimming, then as now. A swimming pool was installed in an old greenhouse attached to the executive mansion. And there the governor would spend as much time as he could take from his official duties and healthful recreation and having a grand time, skylarking in the water. Today, by the way, he's one of the most powerful swimmers in the country. Few can match him with backstroke and leg drag. And it's heartening to know that a fine swimming pool is now being installed for him in the basement of the White House. He can continue to get the exercise he needs to enable him to face his great tasks. But to go back to his rule in New York, there were tense, trying days. The famous Seabury inquiry was probing the government of the city. Samuel Seabury, whom we see arriving at the county courthouse in New York, was getting closer to the mayor of the city, Jimmy Walker. It's Jimmy Walker, slim, smiling, and sprightly, that we see following Judge Seabury into the courthouse. And it became Governor Roosevelt's stern duty eventually to try Mayor Walker on the charges Seabury submitted. A variety of official duties constantly made demands on his energy. Personally, he presided in 1931 at the dedication of the Great Washington Bridge over the Hudson. In the presence of a great crowd on this magnificent bridge, Governor Roosevelt cut the tape which opened the bridge to traffic between New York and New Jersey. And then came the even more tempestuous months in 1932 when the Bonus Expeditionary Army invaded Washington. It was a curious situation because the country had a friendly and sympathetic feeling for the veterans. But when their massed forces settled down to stay until Congress gave them the cash bonus, the government finally came to the decision that it had to take strong measures. Sad, pathetic episode in our current history. But the assembling of the Democratic Convention in 1932 in Chicago drove almost all other topics out of the minds of the people. Already, Franklin D. Roosevelt was the favorite for the nomination. His leading opponent, by a strange travesty of fortune, was none other than his old friend Alfred E. Smith. The keynote was sounded by Senator Barclay of Kentucky. In order, therefore, to obtain the present will of the American people, on this subject of universal controversy, this convention should in the platform here to be adopted recommend the passage by Congress of a resolution repealing the 18th Amendment to the Constitution. But this question of prohibition had adherence on both sides. And meantime, the Dries were meeting in convention and just as vigorously upholding the noble experiment. Repeal swept the Democratic convention, but the presidency was the real fight, and the break came when William Gibbs McAdoo went to the speaker's stand. When any man comes into this convention with 700 votes in it, he's entitled to the nomination. Franklin D. Roosevelt, having received more than two-thirds of all the delegates voting, I proclaim him the nominee of this convention for President of the United States. Upon word of his nomination, Governor Roosevelt broke all precedents away he has by flying to Chicago. The country was thrilled to this news. There was a general sigh of relief when word came that the Roosevelt plane, after fighting through a storm, had landed safely in Chicago. And in a little while, the people heard the roar of cheers that greeted him in the convention hall and his own familiar voice and thanks to the delegates. You have nominated me, and I know it. And I am here to thank you for the honor.
let it also be symbolic that in so doing, I broke tradition. I say to you now that from this date on, the 18th Amendment is doomed. I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. And then the happy release from politics and official worries, back to his first love, the sea. Off with his tall sons on a cruise up the New England coast in a 22-foot yawl. Chief cook and bottle washer as well as admiral. Out into the warm summer sunshine and the health-giving ocean breeze. A prisoner of state no longer, but free and carefree. Just a citizen on vacation. And then as a man must, back to work and official responsibilities, but relieved and refreshed by his swimming pool. And the good fun he has at swimming with his daughter, Mrs. Dahl, and his little grandchild. Only a few weeks more now before the hard grind of the presidential campaign. But he is fit and ready, ready to fight for the presidency. <laughs>